Good evening, everyone. Myself, Devang Somanshi, I'm the new coordinator for IPAC Club, uh, the Isobopal Astronomy Club. I appreciate all of you to come to the session. Uh, thank you so much. So before we start the talk, actual talk, there are some things I would like to uh, you know, show you guys or talk with you guys. So, first of all, welcome. The thing is that when I was doing the publicity or the PR of this particular session, I heard from a lot of you guys that why should I attend this club, uh, club talk, because I am not even a member of the IPAC club. So, please keep in mind that when IPAC was founded by Naveen Shridhar in 2015, from then, from that time till now, during my tenure as well, our main goal of IPAC is that we are an open club. Just there is a team which handles the logistics and technical stuff, but IBAC club is open for everyone. IBAC club is for you guys as well. So any one of you, please, please. So uh, any one of you feels that you want to contribute to the club by giving a talk, or you know, we will highly appreciate it. You can you can contact any one of the members, uh, all the four members. Please raise your hand. So that is Karthik uh, in the blue shirt, Sunena, uh, Nyan Darshini, here is Samya, Roshan, uh, Shri Krishna, uh, then we have Metali, we have the advisor uh, Gaurav, we have Gautam and we have Ranjan Basi. Uh, and we have a very senior member as well, Saksham, uh, he is from fifth year, a very senior member of IPAC. So basically, you can talk with these guys, you can uh, WhatsApp them, mail them, and uh, if you feel that you want to give a talk, please talk with these guys. We will be really happy to help you guys and set up a session for you. So even if you don't feel comfortable in giving a talk, if you feel that you're shy, we have a very, very unique website. Um, you can uh, search Astronomy and Direct ISAB, and we have a story section over here. So we, like basically all the students who are there who are interested in astronomy, they, if they have some idea that they would like to share with the community, they post an article over here. The just recent one is one of your like, uh, batchmates itself, Samya, on Neutrinos. The uh, article below it, Radio Galaxies, I have done it. And there are many more galaxies that you can do. Uh, one done by Ranjan on Astrobiology. There, there are many others as well. Please go through it, and uh, yeah, that's it. So let's move on to the main thing. So before jumping on to the astronomical part of the clusters, what are clusters? Now, if you will, my my English is not very good. So whenever I think of a cluster, I think of a group. Group of anything. It could be anything. It could be a group of planes, some lovely kittens, and some cute puppies. So, by the way, the, 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 the Choco and I think there, there were the puppies and I saw last year. So, I just love them, that's why I put it over there. So, it could be anything. Uh, it doesn't have to be a very huge number, like 1000 or 100. It could be as small as 7, 8, some singular digits or something like that, to call it a cluster. Next. Uh, but in astronomical terms, we like to see numbers. We uh, like to see big digits. So on the left hand side, can anyone guess what it is? Star test. Left hand side. That is what it is written. No, I'm not on the pass. But what it is? Even though it is an SMA is ACL, but what it is? Galaxy cluster. <laughs> if it is like, why is it so famous? Webb's image. Yeah. It was a recent image which was published by James Webb Telescope. It's a very beautiful image. On the right hand side we have PC, we can Masia. see globular cluster. I'll explain what are the globular clusters. That's Messier 12. Next please. So let's start with some basic history about clusters. So if we talk about discovery, there were many people who discovered a lot of things when it comes to cluster. Ptolemy was one of them. So Ptolemy discovered Messier 13, but he saw it with naked eye. He never saw that it was a cluster. He just thought it, thought that this is a single star. And that's why he never came to know that this is a very beautiful collection of many, many stars. Next, Next came uh, Halley, uh, Edmund Halley. 
Edmund Halley, at, during his time, I don't know what his whole name was. So, during his time, telescopes were more advanced. You could see. But even though he could see very more nicely as compared to Ptolemy, he still misidentified it as nebula. So, nebulas are these huge, gigantic clouds. Those are like big, big molecular clouds. You can call them as factories of stars. They produce stars. And from these nebulas itself, star clusters and stars like a sun are So, it was finally John Herschel in 1830. Uh, he used very good telescopes and then he was finally able to see that this is a collection of stars and not a single star or a nebula. And he didn't call it a globular cluster, but uh, he did find out that this is something unique. This is something which we have not seen yet. Next. Uh, so let's jump on to different types of uh, clusters. So there are many types actually. People just generally know open and globular. But there are many as well. There is embedded, there is intermediate, there is a dark globular cluster, which we will not talk about because it's a very recent discovery. Um, so we'll talk about globular cluster, uh, sorry, open cluster first. So what does the word open sound to you? Anyone? Any? Dispersed. Yes, those are dispersed in them. They are not constricted to one place. So as you can see, these are like two beautiful open clusters. One is very famous Pleiades. You can even see it with your naked eye. Uh, and even with your naked eye, you can see it properly that it is properly spread out and it's not like constructed to one piece. So Pleiades is one of them. Hades is also one of them. So these are like two very famous and very close by open clusters to us. As I said, open means they are dispersed. They don't have any proper shape or figure. They are like randomly arranged. As you can see over here, none of them are like similar. Uh, also, there are various paths. So, in open cluster, you will always find very, very young stars. You will never, hardly you will find a very old, very aging star, or uh, stars which are like uh, or belong to population three. I'll come to what is population three stars. Don't worry. Just uh, keep it in mind that population three are very, very old stars. Very old. So next. Yes, sir. You have to wait. I'll explain in a bit later. So we'll talk more bit about their history of how they were discovered. Again, it was Ptolemy. So Ptolemy discovered uh, many clusters like Praspi, I don't know how to pronounce it, sorry. And double clusters. So double cluster, please don't buy don't go by the literal meaning, okay? There's nothing double about it. it is, he just called it double cluster. Because he saw two open clusters very close to each other. So it's not a very different section that we are talking about. It's just what he knew, what he And next one is Ptolemy cluster itself, which you can see very beautiful. Very, you can see. So always remember, whenever you see blue stars anywhere, always remember these are very, very young stars. These are like, what do you can get? You can call them teenagers of stars. They are very young. Next. Uh, so Ptolemy was a great. In Asia, there were many Persian astronomers, especially in uh, Iran and Iraq at those times. So there was a Persian astronomer called Al Sufi. He discovered a new open cluster by himself, which he called, uh, which we today call as Omicron Bellarum cluster. Um, previously by Omicron. <laughs> so next, please. So it was, in, during the 15th and the 16th century, when Galileo huge advancements in his telescopes. He started to look at these clusters and he started to find that how these clusters are, how these clusters actually look like them. But there is a catch. Galileo didn't find out something new. He was just looking what Ptolemy said or what Ptolemy found out during his times. So next please. Uh, by the way, oh, so this is Sidere's uh, so this is a book or what you can say, an article that he wrote and uh, he mentioned about all those open clusters that he's, you know, studied with those, uh, with his telescope. Then it was an Italian amateur astronomer, Giovanni Fodiagno. Sorry. So what he did, he started to find out very new open clusters. 
Like he started to find out new clusters by himself. He was not no more looking at those clusters which was already found out by uh, Ptolemy or some other Persian astronomer or something. He was trying to look something new. So like this, he found the Messier 41 and NGC 2451. Uh, Messier is just a catalog uh, which was done by Charles Messier. And NGC is the new general catalog. It's full, full form. Next please. Uh, yes. So we are talking about uh, like how these clusters were discovered and all that. But when we are talking about this history, there were two ma major important people who tried to like reduce the positions of the individual stars in these clusters. So these two people, Edward and Edward. Okay. <laughs> so both of them uh, were the pioneers in this. Uh, both of them used various different methods using their own telescopes and started to calculate pres not precise about it, but during their times it was precise. Their uh, precise location of these stars in those respective clusters. So, uh, as I said, this is Pleiades. So, Adrian, Adrian Van Man was very important in something. So, how am I sure that all these clusters belong to one system? Or is it so that, suppose for example, this particular star is some, something very different and is not associated with this cluster at all? How can I come, how can we show of that? So what he did, he thought of a very brilliant idea. He took two photographic plates, from, one from 1918 and another one from 1943, if I'm not wrong, and he tried to compare it. He tried to compare both of these. And what he found out, that the velocities of the individual stars were very similar to the velocity of the entire star cluster, star cluster itself. And that's how, with some more mathematics and all, he was able to come to a conclusion that, okay, these all of these stars, what you can see in this cluster, they all belong to the one single system, and they are not like, this belong, this does not belong to other system or something like that. Thank you. Yeah, now formation. So, yeah. So can we say that if there are some stars and there is no relative motion in between them, so they form a cluster? Uh, not exactly because, see, uh, to talk in advanced stuff, there are some relative motions happening in a cluster itself. There are always some disturbances happening. So you can't exactly say that there will be zero relative motion. But you can be sure of that uh, if you find a comparison between all of them, uh, that they are following the same path or the same trajectory, hmm. then we can see that these okay. clusters belong to the same, uh, sorry, these stars belong to the same cluster. Oh, sorry. So formation, how are these stars formed? Or how are these clusters, open clusters are formed? So to understand more about open clusters, we have to understand more about embedded star cluster, which will be by the end of the talk, which is the main highlight of the talk itself. So let's try to talk about how stars are formed in a very simple way, not going too much in detail. So you have this huge gigantic curves. These are not the same curves, by the way. These are very different curves. By the way, this is a Rosetta Nebula. curve. Um, so these clouds have a tremendous amount of hydrogen in them, and they have the capacity to form these stars. Uh, how do they form? They need a trigger. So nothing would be formed without a trigger. They need something. And that trigger could be any kind of turbulence. Maybe a nearby star died, and the shock waves that are sent from that death of the star can trigger it and can cause the collapse of the cloud and form a star. Other than that, there are other things happening as well. Suppose two molecular clouds colliding with each other. This collision is enough to make sure that there is a sufficient amount of temperature and density created so that the uh, cloud collapses and forms into a single star. There is something called a Jeans mass limit. Uh, so Jeans mass limit talks about, I'll go into this over on top of it, that the minimum amount of mass required in a particular cloud to cause that particular cloud to collapse is your basically Jeans mass limit or even people call it genes instability. Genes instability depends on density as well, temperature as well. These are like various factors as well. 
So let's, but right for now, let's talk about Mars. So these clouds have the potential to form huge stars. Now it depends how much amount of mass has been collapsed. So on the basis of that, uh, what type of star, what will be its mass, uh, it depends on the like, ways to ways, as I can say. Next please. One thing I forgot to mention, that whenever these uh, stars are forming, there is a huge possibility that they How the cluster is formed? You said that so it is because of the collision and the stars are forming, right? Mm -hmm. But how a cluster is formed? formed? So basically, if you look at the gene stability, gene stability, let's take a huge cloud, and they have all the entire cloud is like collapsing. So, but if you look into the cloud itself, there are some clumps that are being formed. So those clumps, individual clumps, what you can say, they act as a, a small cloud itself, and they also start to collapse. And that's how we can say like uh, star clusters might have formed. This clumps make the star cluster. Yep. So there is one single cloud. Okay. And in that collapsing cloud itself, there are many other clumps which are formed. Clumps of cloud itself. And those clumps are also like collapsing along with this. So genes, uh, what happens? Nature will never allow a single huge big mole big molecular cloud to collapse to form a single star. It will always try to look at chaos or chaos I mean like uh, multiple ways of like forming more and more stars. So these clumps will be formed and these individual clumps will collapse again. So by that argument every uh, nebula should form a cluster. Huh? Everyone does. So is every star part of the cluster? No. So we have this huge single cloud, and this is collapsing under its gravity or whatever. And when it's collapsing, uh, the inside gas, small clumps are formed. Like this. So I'm just drawing my things. These individual clumps then again start to collapse, and these. Uh, in these clumps, in these clumps are very, very big. More clumps are formed. And this way, we can find a lot of stars forming, uh, a lot of stars forming inside a huge single molecule. I hope that's what your question is. Is every star part of the cluster? Cluster, yes. There has to be. The thing is, we are not part of the cluster. Yeah. The thing is, we used to be there. Okay. But then somehow, something happened. There was some disturbance, and our star was thrown out of the system. I'll come to that. You have to be patient about it. So you are saying these different clumps, each of them is forming a cluster? Yep. That's so always there is a group of clusters which is forming like in a particular localized place. Hmm. No, I didn't get it. So there is a giant molecular cloud. There is a giant molecular cloud. You are saying in that uh, because of this gravitational collapse, there are different uh, clumps are of the gas, mm -hmm. and each of this clump in, in, in this in the clump it itself, might be. It might be. It's not that in these individual clumps, it's that more clumps will be formed. Generally, if the those clumps are big enough, clumps can be formed. But if the clumps are very small, that they will form only a single normal average star like a sun. They won't go into more clumps. It depends on a lot of stuff as well. No, I mean, I'm saying, so first you had star formation or cluster formation? You had a single star formation. Single but star. yeah, a huge molecular cloud was trying to form a single star. But as you can see, the nature never allows it. So small clumps are formed. Is there any mathematical reason with why is it not allowed? I'm not actually very sure. Nature does not first of all, the cloud does not try to form a star, it tries to form a star. Yeah. Does the water actually happen in the form B? No, it never does. Ha, so how does the clouds form? So basically, the formation of the clouds is something that I also have understood very nicely. <laughs> but what I, what I have understood uh, is that the turbulence itself is a major cause. Uh, to, to what we can say, to the formation of these clumps. 
the balance that was there. It is disturbed basically. And this disturbance is again causes some of the stars. It not gen now it depends on the situation. Uh, basically how what kind of close by or uh, encounter it is. On the basis of that, uh, the number of stars which will be thrown out or which will remain inside will be. clusters are formed this way like there you said there are different types of clusters and you said that this is how clusters are formed so all clusters are formed this way so we are not sure about globular clusters globular clusters are way too old we think that i'll talk about this a moment uh, but what i will give a glimpse we think that whenever the universe was formed after like billions of years not many billions of years like some less amount of billions of years globular clusters <coughs> But we are not very sure, like how they were formed. There is one theory that so initially we had a very large giant molecular clouds. Uh, can we go on to the like when the globular section comes because we are on the globular cluster formation. Oh, but we can talk about it when the globular cluster comes. So yes, I talked about a double cluster which was found by Carl himself. So basically, what he found are these two associations. So you can see over here this H cosine, uh, or what you can see. Uh, I call it, I like to call it H over C for some reason. And this is chi cosine. So both of these open clusters are like in a gravitational bound, gravitationally bound to each other in some way. We don't know what's the future maybe they will collide with me, they might not. Depends. So what I was trying to say that uh, I was trying to show here that that there might be some clusters. Which can be like together. This was this is what I was trying to set to you. Next, please. Yeah. So we have discussed a lot about open clusters, but there is an open question. Uh, there is a question: How do we classify them? There should be a way that we should be able to classify them. Okay. This is a one particular open cluster. I call it A. There is another. I call it B. There is another. I call it Z. X. Something. So it was Robert Trumpler. Robert Trumpler was a very good astronomer. So he never wanted to find out the like, classification of open clusters. He was very very keen to understand the size of the galaxy itself. So he used very different methods. In one of his methods, he uh, what he thought that let's take sun to be very closer to the center of our Milky Way, and that's how we'll calculate the size of the galaxy. But he was proven wrong. We don't have to go in that. Uh, our job is not talk about what he did over there. But our job is to talk about what he did regarding classification of open clusters. So what he did, he started to classify open clusters on the amount of stars that each cluster has, then concentration or how constructed it is or how dense it is, and uh, and obviously its brightness. So yeah, so Trumpler classification system depends on three main factors: the concentration, how concentrated the stars are in a particular open cluster, 
the range of brightness, how bright these stars are. And the third is origin number of the clusters. That is basically Trumpler 14, which is uh, named after Trumpler himself. So these are like, uh, what do you call it, classification system. So in, in terms of degree of concentration, the Roman numerical one will be given to a cluster uh, with, which has a very strong central concentration. If you go to the second, the concentration of, the central concentration will decrease. If you go to the third, it will decrease more. No noticeable concentration. And then in the fourth, we will not see any proper concentration at all. It will be completely dispersed, like how an open cluster should be. Then the brightness, brightness are uh, classified as one, two, three. So if a particular open cluster is uh, classified as one in terms of brightness, it means that all the stars that are present in that particular cluster have the same range of brightness. If, we, if it is second, then the range of back, uh, brightness is moderate. If it is third, then basically the cluster has both faint stars as well as bright stars. While, the, while we come to the third category of trunk classification is the number of stars. So P stands for four, uh, less than 50 stars. M for medium rich, 50 to 100. And R is rich, which is more than 100 stars. Next please. How do you quantify strong So one way that Trump did it was measuring, uh, sorry, comparing the star cluster itself. So you take a yeah. sort of wide range of data sets. So you all compare those data uh, like images actually, not data sets. There were no data sets to be used. So you compare those images, and that's how you can say, huh, this particular section has a lot of, a lot of amount of central concentration as compared to this section. Okay? So this is a map which I got. Uh, you can all visit to LKD's photographic website. He has made this beautiful section, like a map sort of thing, a grid, um, where he has tried to classify, not classify, um, try to make sure that how the trumper classification changes from one to four in terms of their central concentration and from a Roman numerical and R to P in terms of number of stars that are present. So if you look at this particular cluster, so you can see it has a very strong amount of central concentration. And if you go towards the right hand side, second, it means what? Concentration will become less. So what we can see from here. There are more images that I have to show, you will understand it more nicely if you can't see this image properly. And but what I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to give you this idea about how you know, this particular thing changes according to Roman numericals and R and E. Third, more, more degrees of central concentration. Four, more degrees. Now if you go down, the number of stars will decrease. So if you look at the second section, or the second no Roman numerical, when it was in R section, it had a lot of stars, but if you go to the bottom, the number of stars decreases. And in this particular cluster, uh, the number of stars are very less. Uh, while taking this image, yeah, LKD has made one assumption that the brightness range of all these clusters is around the same, approximately same. Next so let's talk about degree of concentration. So basically, we, we have two clusters over here, and both the clusters are classified as one three R. Uh, this is one three R, and this is one two R. So a question for you, what should you see in both of these? What comparison should you make? I just told you what Com these two. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, so what should three then? The lead, or not lead, Less brighter. So what did three say? The cluster is composed of brain as well as bright stars. 
But uh, second says the more the range of the brightness is quite moderate. Go back to this image. So you can see you cannot make it out very clearly by looking at this image. But if you try to look it very closely at at place where I'm standing, I can see that there are some old stars, old I mean reddish and orangish type of colors. That's a vague way to say that. Uh, these can be old stars or young stars. And there are a lot of blue stars over here in this one. But if you go to second, you can see a wide range of like blue stars as well. There are some orange, but uh, these are orange, I think those are basically not part of the cluster and those are like closer to us. They're like <laughs> in between us and the, the cluster that we are seeing. Next please. Second, we are talking about Roman numerical 2. So in Roman numerical 2, what will happen? Concentration will decrease. Yes? Uh, between the older stars and younger stars, so if there is a cluster, then the age should be same, right? Yep, but there can be some cases, like in, if you take the average of the age of the cluster, everything should be same. But there can be cases where an individual star, I am not talking about a large number of stars, but individual stars can be like, you know, of a different age. Or maybe of like, not, uh, does not show the same age as the average stars, something like that. This 2-3 represents the brightness, not the age. They represent the brightness. <coughs> this may be related to the mass of the stars instead of yep. the age. Yeah. Because age is more or less the same. Mm -hmm. it so the it is mass. dependent on the mass itself. Yeah. So the mass is the main contributor to the brightness of this particular stars in the cluster. So again, one more thing. We talk, now both the clusters have the same thing. And what, what changed has happened? It is our rich, rich in stars. Second, brightness rate is moderate. But this Roman numerical. What does it tell us? As compared to Roman numerical 1, the central concentration has decreased. Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the previous No. Uh, so, if you compare this with the next slide, you can see the concentration has decreased a lot. So, next slide. You can make a fair comparison. Next, please. Yeah. So, Roman numerical 3 will tell us more that no noticeable concentration. We can see that the stars are like very nicely dispersed. Though the like, classification is not the same, but we can see that there is no like perfect concentration of stars at one particular location. They are all dispersed very nicely in the same sense. Now over here, when degree of concentration reaches 4, or the classification reaches 4, there is no concentration at all. Like stars are very, very dispersed. They're scattered like anything. That's the same thing what we can see in these two clusters no proper concentration scattered anyway. Yeah, that's it. How is that different from not being a cluster at all? If they are completely scattered. Gravitation mm -hmm. so form. Yeah. Yeah. See, uh, if you look brightness, brightness they should have the same, uh, as well as their age, they should have the same age with the brightness. Also the bright, yeah, common origin, yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Velocity is good. They should have a common velocity or a common trajectory. Yeah. 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 But one will tell us what? Okay. Very bright. Good. Let's move to the next. What up? Uh, uh, why they forget about this one? This is not a black one. Wait, uh, they are just like, uh, there might, must be a star uh, like in between the cluster and us. And it might be obscuring the, or disturbing the data that we were looking at. So they just have just like, made a black spot over there. When we are considering these cluster images, so are we keeping in mind that there may be, if there is like, if there is a change in the brightness, there is brighter stars and there is 
some painter stars, then they can be filled stars as well. They can be filled stars as well. If you are considering the image, and if you want to classify it, and we are considering the brightness of the stars. So before that, are we considering that is this a cluster, is this a cluster member or is this a filled star? Yeah, uh, we are exactly looking at that as well. So what new scientists do, uh, they, they basically take the old data that they say that this is a particular cluster. If they find a particular association that this star, you know, it's questionable whether it's part of cluster or whether it is between us or it's not part of cluster. They will obviously try to look into it. Uh, I don't exactly remember like what data or what methods they, do they use to exactly see like um, how can you They might be looking at the velocity of the stars itself, like whether it is different from the individual stars of the cluster, or the uh, velocity of the cluster itself. Obviously, if, if it's not the part of the cluster, obviously it has to be different. There, there might be like very like marginal cases or like very small amount of cases, like uh, it is very like close to each other the amount of velocities, or they might be same. I, I don't think so that there will be so much less gap. I hope I have answered. I hope I have answered. Like basically before classifying from the image directly, we need to make sure that yeah, yeah, yeah. the stars you are looking at are the cluster stars. Yeah. And none of them is the fit star. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. What I think it is, the star is again maybe not part of the clusters, and maybe it's like between us and the cluster, the cluster itself. But what you can see, faint star. That's what I was trying to say. Yes. Now we move on to the number of stars. P P stands for four. Uh, less number of stars, less than 50. So if you can see in these particular two clusters, uh, forget about the Roman numerical and the numerical one, just look at P. The number of stars is very less as compared to what images we will see in further. So we have this R. Uh, it's not R. Uh, it's okay. So R stands for rich. So obviously you will have a lot of amount of stars in these particular clusters. Next please. And yes, uh, when Trumpler was trying to make his classification about open clusters, he found out there are some open clusters which have nebula uh, around it or close to it or whatever you want to say. So for these particular types of clusters, he added N which uh, represents the nebula or the nebulosity present around that particular cluster or inside the cluster. So, some basic facts. This is, can anyone tell me the common name of this cluster? Or I will tell you the common name. It's Caroline cluster. But who is Caroline? Sorry, someone answered. She was related to a very famous person. So, Caroline was none other than brother of Herschel. Uh, her name was Caroline Herschel. Both of them made huge advancements in identifying new types of object, astronomical objects in the night sky. So, that's what I was saying. So, all the stars in particular open clusters are formed from the same molecular curve. There can be no case unless we are not, if we are considering any disturbance by some external factors that some other star from another cluster came and joined this particular other cluster. So if we are ignoring that, all the stars should be formed from the same cloud itself. So when the particular, now the second statement, I would like to rephrase it, a particular open cluster dies 
when all the stars in that particular cluster disperse away. Because if those stars disperse away and they are no longer in any gravitation, gravitational bomb or association, it's no longer open cluster. You cannot say it's a cluster. Those are like individual stars now going on their way and somewhere in the cosmos. So similarly, our sun was also part of, maybe a part of some open cluster. Me, there is a huge me. Or it might not globular cluster, no, it's globular, but some open cluster. And something must have happened. Some gravitational disturbance, some external or internal effects, and the, and our sun might have been thrown out of the system. That's what happens to all the stars in a particular open cluster. So our, uh, So you are trying to say that there are like two, three more stars which are like sun. No, no, like let's say like isolated solar system. Huh. But their stars also are part of the Yeah, they have to be. All of them, rigidly. Not rigidly, I would say. Because there can be a case in a molecular cloud in one particular section that an individual star might have. And what I said about those clumps and the discussion that we had, the uh, amount of clusters that were formed, or uh, the number of stars that were formed in the particular system, mm -hmm. it might have not gone through that particular system. Not all clumps of than 
or spiral galaxy or the, uh, sorry, lenticular galaxy or an elliptical galaxy. So basically in an elliptical or lenticular galaxy, you can hardly find any open clusters. Why? Because to form an open cluster, you need gas. And these galaxies are devoid, devoid of that. They don't have a lot of gas or sufficient amount of gas to form these new clusters. So it is very hard to, to say that, okay, I found a new open clusters, a new open cluster in an irregular or lenticular galaxy. If, if, if a particular uh, elliptical galaxy passes through a huge molecular cloud, which can happen, or uh, something, uh, something gets triggered, obviously, uh, and new cluster, probability of finding new open clusters will increase. If there is like collision or merger with another one. Uh, how many of you know this stuff? V I S T A. <laughs> Not that one. So, this stuff stands for Visible and Infrared Survey Telescope of Astronomy. For astronomy, sorry. Uh, so it's a telescope, obviously. And what it did, it took images of a lot of these open clusters and it formed the one single image of them. I just wanted to show you guys like open clusters and all that stuff. Nothing in your world. So, as I said, uh, there is something called a stellar association. So stellar association refers, or they are also called as mooning groups. These are like open clusters, but the amount of density is less than open cluster itself. So if you compare any stellar association, which is shown, by the way, these are all stellar association you can find near sun. So if you compare it with any open cluster, the amount of density will always be less as compared to the I'm sorry, uh, open cluster. Next, please. So, it was a Soviet astronomer, like the, I'm going to see him. So, he was the one in, I guess, after World War II in 1947, he was the one who discovered this stellar association. So, here's one example. Uh, so, before that, he started to classify them uh, as OB and T. So, these are like stellar groups or uh, stellar class. Uh, and basically, T stands for T Tauri stars. And OB uh, are like very bright, very young, like very energetic stars. They are like they are like recent teenagers or something. What you can say, general way, don't go in. So we have one example of a stellar association or a moving group, Ursa Major. Obviously, you can find it in Ursa Major constellation. And as far as I remember, they fall under the category of OB itself as a star that are present in this association. Uh, their spectral class is O or O. So when, one thing when I was reading about this uh, stellar association, this thing came in my mind. Just because an open cluster lose some of its density, it became a stellar association. So I thought it was very funny and I had to put this in my so, so I've talked a lot about open clusters to you guys. But you should say, why do I care about this? You should actually. Because the next slide tells a lot. Tells a lot. So this is Hertzsprung Russell diagram for two clusters, and 67 denoted by yellow, and NGC 188 by blue, or light blue, sky blue. Students, everyone see this diagram in front Everyone? So this is the main sequence. So where the uh, main sequence is a particular place uh, in a Hertzsprung Russell diagram uh, where stars are present. And you can see this particular breakoff that is happening above us. So that, that is called the main sequence turnoff or turnoff for main sequence. I don't know the exact word. I'm sorry about it. But it's something related to turnoff of main sequence. So basically, this turnoff helps us to find the age of a particular open cluster. And apart from that, 
there is there are two important elements in when you are studying open clusters one is lithium and one is beryllium so why these two things are important so basically we know that at roughly around 10000 kelvin uh, hydrogen fuses into helium and around if i am not wrong 3 to 4000 kelvin is for lithium and for beryllium it's around like 6 to 8 I'm not very really sure. I'm not too good with numbers. So, the amount of lithium and beryllium in a particular open cluster will take, tell us the amount of uh, mixing that is happening in a particular star. So, we have a star, and in that particular star, obviously the layers are mixing with each other, and uh, this mixing uh, causes or uh, results into formation of lithium and beryllium. In most stuff, not all of the stuff. So, as I said, lithium and beryllium are again important uh, to study the age of these particular open clusters. Uh, up till this point, any questions? Because we will soon start with the regular clusters. I hope. Good. Thank you. So, more things about open clusters. As I said, there are unstable, high differences of velocities. internal and external effects keep happening and uh, stars can wander around and go out of a particular system and be independent from the uh, parent star clusters as i said internal and external effects internal is because of closing encounters two stars passing through each other very rapidly that can cause an imbalance uh, in the gravitational boundness or association association in a particular plus uh, in that star of that cluster so and the external effects passing through external object a molecular cloud molecular clouds are huge they can have a huge gravitational pull on the star cluster itself and obviously it can cause the disturbance in the individual stars also uh yes i i have i have said this that basically when all the stars in an open cluster disperse away it's the death of the open it makes sense right <laughs> if there are no stars there's no cluster okay. at all so basically the life expectancy of any star cluster or uh, i mean open star cluster this depends upon how strongly the stars in that particular system are bounded to each other if you have strong gravitational attraction strong forces the life expectancy of that particular cluster will be open cluster will be more as compared to those who have less gravitational uh, attraction or boundness to each other or association so in other words just uh, depends on the mass of each of the stars in the cluster for the distance between them so what no you didn't anyway so at last as i said before open clusters because of these disturbances later on turn out to be stellar association and after if there are more disturbances the stars from this stellar association also disperse away and become independent next is ha now global global what does it tell you like you are seeing open clusters you are seeing looking at a global cluster what should it tell you highly concentrated exactly highly concentrated highly dense these are most these clusters have a particular shape you can if you look at the images of any globular cluster you can tell that they have a particular shape that you can you know picture them into open clusters generally they don't have any shape they are randomly dispersed i don't have to say this more like it must be fitted in memory so next please so let's talk about more discovery uh, there were many astronomers i got this from wikipedia so there were many people whose name i cannot pronounce really pronounce it okay <laughs> but it was abraham hill uh, from germany he was an amateur astronomer and in the uh, in the 17th or the 16th century he found discovered the n22 as he found it this name and there was some other people who i don't know how to pronounce their names so, so. so it was john herschel himself uh, the older brother of kathleen herschel uh, who discovered This particular star cluster. Can anyone tell us? Can 
understanding and motivation with some of this stuff. It's an animation. So, uh, in the 19th century, we discovered it. No. Uh, yes, and it was again, as I said, there was Giovanni, both Diana, whatever, uh, who discovered new open clusters on, by himself using his telescope. It was, I mean, he could have been there. So that was very So he was the one, he used his own telescope and he found out new globular clusters by himself. Thanks. This is all history, right? You love us. This is material, obviously. So the, the reason why I'm putting this image is globular clusters are mainly found in this region as well as this, this region. And this is called a halo community. Why? Can anyone think of it? Any why? Random guess. So They are not that massive enough to change the galaxy Because most of the globular clusters that we can find in the halo, as I told you, the region around the galaxy, is actually not, they didn't belong to the Milky Way itself. They belong to some other galaxies, which Milky Way engulfed, or like, had it for it enough. So the globular clusters from those particular galaxies were engulfed, or not engulfed, were taken up and they remain in this particular big halo that we can see over here. Now, how do we classify them? So there are three people uh, who decided to classify them depending on the concentration, the amount, how much concentrated they are. So there are Henrietta, Arrow, and Helen. All three of these took a lot of data, they compared it, and they started to classify each globular clusters from Roman numerical 1 to 12. And if you go from 1 to 12, the amount of concentration in each particular globular cluster should decrease. So, yeah. So this is Messier 75. Uh, as you can see, Roman numerical 1, highly concentrated. You can see there is a dense sphere that is formed over here. But if you go to the second, even though you cannot make it out very clearly, but you can feel that the concentration has decreased. Yes. So if you go on from 3 to 4, the, you should just look at how dense it is, the concentration. And it keeps on decreasing. Go next. The 5, the 5th, next. 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And you can see this column at 12. There is no concentration at all. It feels like an open cluster. Then how can, even if it looks like open cluster, then how can we say it's a closed cluster? Any idea? I was, I was a bit 
I was very confused, like how are you trying to you know, classify these things? Because if you look at one and five, they are the same thing. There's no difference at all. So if you have anyone has watched Office, this is a like, very famous thing from that. Yes. Uh, the formation. As I said, these clusters are the oldest things in our universe. When the universe was like few billion years old, these things were formed. We don't know any knowledge about how they were formed. No one knows. There is huge amount of research that is going on trying to find out how these particular globular clusters or these clusters were formed. Now, uh, but what I can say, the thing that we have, we were having this discussion about this clubs that were formed, it might be a possible reason. I won't say it, it is a possible, it is, a, it is the reason, but it might be one of the possible reasons why we can see these formation of such kind of globular clusters. Next, where can you find global clusters? If you need so many stars, because uh, the number of stars uh, in a global cluster is way larger than the number of stars in an open cluster. So you need a tremendous amount of gas. And in which galaxy you can find tremendous amount of molecular gas? I did told you a few slides back. Non-irregular. Irregular. So irregular galaxies are the prominent candidates to find globular clusters. And uh, obviously, like open clusters, the globular clusters are also found from a single molecular cloud, which has collapsed or contracted. You, uh, someone said irregular galaxy, but there are, are other types of galaxies one can find, and that is starburst or interacting galaxy. So starburst, what is starburst galaxy? A galaxy which has gone completely mad in terms of star formation. So generally, let's say, uh, let's take this as an example. Our Milky Way produces hundred stars in one year. I actually, it's a lot. Hundred stars is not. But let's take it for a rough example. In a starburst galaxy, it might go up to 5,000. So you can say that um, that particular galaxy is high when it comes to star formation. Uh, interacting galaxies, you have two galaxies which are colliding with each other. And now if you have two galaxies, you have both of their molecular gases. Means you have a, the, the amount of gas that was present has doubled or tripled, whatever you can say. So the amount of globulous cluster that can be formed, or the probability of their formation also increases. <laughs> so as I said before, uh, majority of the globular clusters in our Milky Way were stripped apart or taken away from irregular galaxies. These irregular galaxies were close to us, and as Milky Way has a huge gravitational pull on them, they were engulfed. And along with it, the globular clusters are also in. And uh, yes, one more thing. There are hardly, like, whatever globular clusters that astronomers or astrophysicists have researched, there are hardly any globular clusters in which you can see star formation. There's no gas at all. Because all of the gas, either it was used up to form the stars, or the next. At that time, the globular cluster was formed, or it was stripped away due to the radiation pressure of the stars uh, that were formed in the globular clusters. Uh, before conclusion, uh, I want to talk something. If we take two stars in a globular cluster, let's take at the center of a globular cluster, or close to the center. Their distances are so small that the probability that you can have a planet over there is very less. So if you take, uh, let's say that our star and um, suppose Sirius is just one kilometer apart, let's say. So if you divide it by three, that is almost like 330 meters. Uh, that is the amount of distance between two stars in a globular cluster at its center. It's that close, they're so close to each other. 
So talking about composition, um, the, the stars that are present in these globular clusters are very good, as I said. They are the oldest stars you can find. Population two stars. Population one, I will tell you more about. As I said, population two stars have really low metallicity. Metals, the amount of metals is very less as compared to population three. And uh, uh, no dust, no gas, no star formation. Um, high density, as I said before, I gave you an analogy of two stars, how close they might be to each other. Now, uh, I, I was saying pop one, pop two, pop three, what is it? So basically it was void of weight. And he started to classify stars into various categories. So he, these are the three categories that he came up with. Population 1, population 2, and population 3. Population 1 are stars like a sun. They are young, they are metal rich, you can find a lot of metals in them. Population 2, as compared to population 1, they are older. And you can find less amount of metals. Population 3 is a hypothetical situation. We have nowhere found a star which, is, which belongs to population 3. There are few candidates, but those few candidates also belong to population 3 itself. And as, why hypothetical? These are the youngest and the, like the most youngest star that were formed in the universe. And they have zero metallicity, which is not a Yes, large. Why zero metallicity stars are there? Mm -hmm. I mean, you said that population three stars, we don't have any uh, example of this. Mm -hmm. And they have zero metallicity. Why is there so many? What is the relation of zero metallicity? So the thing is, uh, whenever a star is formed, it is formed out of H2, right? Uh, I hope you know this. So we have a big H2 cloud, it forms out of it. So whenever a star dies, so uh, some I won't, won't go into detail much, but there are a lot of processes that happen. Uh, there is a fusion that takes place in the core of the star where new elements are produced. So obviously, uh, new elements will be produced and they will die out. They will spread out in the cosmos, and whatever by that day, uh, new stars will. Because as I said, when a star dies, it will give out gas. So from that gas, there is a probability that a new star will be So that new star will have more amount of metallicity, right? So if you go from population three to population one, and population three stars die, they have they produce metals, and those metals went into population two. When those population two stars die, they produce more metals, and those more metals. One. I hope I answered the question. You can't have zero metallicity in star. Sorry? You can't have zero metallicity. Is it possible to find a star with zero metallicity in today's age? Today's age. Uh, today's age and it will find a star. Why is there zero metallicity? Because the point is that stars form. The new age stars that are formed are formed from the older star matter or dust clouds, which are already mostly, almost probably collapsed in the stars. So if they have already formed from the earlier stars which have formed the metal phase, right? Can they can the new stars have zero metallicity at all? Uh, I I don't think so. They should have zero. The new star, the pop two and pop one, the new stars. They should because they were formed out of pop three, and those pop three formed a lot of metals, right. as you said. So which were dispersed out in its what you can say, cosmos or what space or whatever, and from those. They were present in the molecular clouds, and from those molecular clouds itself, or the gas, they collapsed and contracted to form new stars. So, obviously, yes. In today's day, that's what I mean, right now, after the next universe is lived, you're going to be doing this. Is it possible to have a star in the universe? Sure, but expert, but like, observationally, I don't think so. Because theoretically, it should be sure. Yeah, theoretically, as far as I know, I might be wrong. It should have a, uh, like, uh, by theory, there should you be. You know why they have, uh, there are, it's a very rare chance to find a population three star right now. Because we all have 
or should they have very far away from us? No, no, no. First of all, the point is uh, the stars of the golden age. Okay, they were massive. They were uh, they had mostly hydrogen uh, concentration. They were massive. They were highly uh, uh, and uh, they were big, right? So, uh, what's the correlation between mass and age? So, more the mass, less will be the age. Right, so the population 3 stars are extremely massive. Yes, so, so the age will have the same, right. they will die in a few minutes. Right, they should have been. That's the thing. The only way a population 3 star will survive is if it's, if it's isolated enough. Okay, but even if it's isolated enough, it should, by your second law of thermodynamics, get like uh, dispersed into multiple most stellar systems or dust stars. Right. And even if that happens, <laughs> the uh, metallicity should still be there because the point is that they, the stars burst only after forming metals because that's literally the fuel system of the stars. Okay, so you can't have a metallicity in your star, theoretically. If you found that anomaly, you would study that. But theoretically, you actually shouldn't be in today's age because most stars that used to have zero metallicity should have been. That's the point. Light coming from here, I will uh, cause attenuation of the light 
and only longer wavelengths will be faster. And more amount of dust I have, more longer wavelengths. And one at one point, it will go beyond the optical region in the infrared uh, region. And no longer we can see it in the optical, by the optical telescopes. Only. So we need infrared telescopes to look at this particular thing. So as I said, these are the infant open clusters. So how do they become like adult open clusters? So, everyone remembers radiation pressure? What radiation pressure does? It disperses of the gas surface. So the stars that are formed. Remember, the stars in an open cluster are massive and young. So if you have a massive star, the amount of radiation that it will throw out will also be greater. So the more amount of pressure will be thrown out. And the amount, like, uh, I'll tell this further, but by this radiation pressure, more amount, uh, more amount of gas will disperse, and after some million years, the open cluster that we have will finally become independent of its molecular form. Now, uh, yeah, no, no. so basically, how much time does it take? It depends on the stars that are found, rather than star, the mass of the stars. So more mass. More, more light, more radiation, more radiation pressure, more amount of gas will be dispersed, and quickly it will happen. So if you have more massive stars, um, what you can say? The quickly the surrounding gas will be dispersed away. So there are many people who have done a lot of research. So first it was uh, Lisa Ritz in 1989. Uh, he came up with his research and told that for an average embedded star cluster, it takes around 5 million years to disperse the gas around itself and become independent. Later on, in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1990 and 2013, two independent research groups did different amount of research, uh, sorry, different kind of research, and they were able to come up with different conclusions. Uh, one that happened in 1990 said it was one to two million years, but the one happened in 2013. Uh, as per what I've read from the CFA, Center for Astrophysics Harvard University, the data that they collected uh, in 2013 was more accurate than the 1990. So now right now we think that for an embedded star cluster like this one, uh, Vessel and 2, uh, it takes almost 3 million years. Next please. Yes, so I hope that many of you are interested in astronomy. And uh, if you are learning about astronomy, you should know about some things. There is NED, NASA Extra Galactic Database. There is SIMBARD. SIMBARD is the, gal not galactic, it's a database for uh, created by the University of Strasbourg, Strasbourg in France. So if you are keen to do astronomy or astrophysics in any field, you should use these fields a lot uh, or websites a lot. These are open websites. It's for free. You can go type it. Uh, NAD is more like, it's not very interactive, I would say. But I would prefer uh, Strasbourg Simbad a lot. It's not highly interactive. We might even have a talk about this. Yeah, sure. Why not? Yes. <laughs> so basically, uh, you start, if you're very keen to learn something in astronomy and astrophysics, please start using this. This is a very good thing. It, Really, it's a good thing if you know Simbad or NAD or something like that, or ADS. ADS, you can find research papers on ADS, but these things are there. So I've taken these images by myself uh, from the Strasbourg database, Simbad. So basically, this is NGC 3603, and what you can see in the above is the DSS color map. DSS stands for Digital Sky Survey. These are the different sky surveys that were taken by different telescopes, by different uh, in different countries uh, of the night sky, and uh, in these two, both are digital sky survey. Uh, sky survey, both are belong to DSS, but I changed the colors. This is the native color. What native means? What we can really see. And this is color which we call as green. So what I'm trying to show, uh, I'm not very sure whether you can see this reddish color over there. There is a reddish color there. Can anyone see? Yes. Just look at my finger. So this particular region is a probable uh, embedded star cluster. But I cannot see it perfectly. 
in the native color. So I changed the color. And I started to see in rain, what can I see? I can see that there is a lot of star formation happening. There is a gas as well over here. If you can see in light greenish some color. And reddish shows some stars as well as some gas which are highly heated up. So I can see that there is an embedded cluster here. There are some over here as well. But let's try to focus over here. It's a small thing. So there are some embedded clusters which are dispersing the gas around itself, trying to be independent. Next, please. But a bit. Uh, but the thing is, BSS is an optical region. I can, as I said before, it's not good to see an embedded star cluster in an optical region. I hope now everyone knows why. I want to see it in infrared. So I use the two mass color now. Uh, two mass stands for two micron. Uh, all sky survey, yes. So it stands for 2 micron all sky survey. Also seen uh, NGC 3603. Now you can see there are a lot of amount of stars as compared to the previous one. Can you move back to the You see over here, and next slide, the amount of stars has increased because now we are looking in the infrared spectrum. You can see a lot of amount of stars. Now I change the color again. Now it's raining. I can see more amount of stars and I can see a bit more gas around itself. Shows like it's a perfect embedded star cluster. Thanks, please. This is Trump 14. So it's a very beautiful molecular cloud. I really love it. Again, this is in DSS uh, in native colors. Uh, this reticle shows you, uh, it's not actually pinpointing at the embedded star cluster, but what I was trying to look out that this is the prime location of where you can find this embedded star cluster. <coughs> this is in different color, but still you cannot see perfectly. Like, what are there any stars over here? You can just see the gas. I hope everyone is getting it. Yes. Yes. Next. I use now two mass which is very color. Now I can no longer see the gas, bright gas. I can see more amount of stars over here. I can see a lot of stars. Um, I share the slides. You can look at it very closely later on, and uh, we can find out the stars over here. So there are more amount of stars, uh, and this is in native color. Please change this. Thanks, thanks. Huh. Now I use the rainbow colors. Now I can perfectly see in this reticle itself, there is a star formation taking place. There is an open cluster in red, and in the background you can see a gas, which is associated with the or embedded star cluster itself. And I guess uh, you can use Simba as a very cool place. I have not taken up an image I should have, but I'll show you later on. It's a very cool portal. You can type any object that you want to see and you can look at it different maps. There are a lot of maps. You can see it in gamma, you can see it in gas line, you can see it in optical, and there are various different maps done by various different observatories around the world. Now, the next important one, which is, I found to be my person, right? uh, the intermediate star cluster. What does the intermediate, now we are at the end of the talk, we are like last section of it. So what are intermediate star clusters? By the name, it's, I know it's in the slide, but still, go ahead. What you can think of? Between open and huh? open. Yes, exactly. So these star clusters show the characteristics of both open as well as globular. Why globular? Like globular, there are hundreds of thousands of stars, and they show the same metal metallicity as any globular cluster, as well as the stellar population. Majority in intermediate star cluster, you will find POC2 stars. POC2, I hope now I will um, But why open stars? These clusters are huge in size and they are dispersed. They are no longer like in a perfect concentrated or constricted form, like what we saw in globular clusters. Uh, and there are three examples, all starting from F31, WSS, C1, C2, C3. And I have a face time image of Andromeda and C1. Why? Can anyone guess why? Instead of the star cluster, why that is the image of the Andromeda galaxy? Anything is. Anyone 
uh, even if they have even paranoids, I just put it for the meme scene. But in global clusters, it's not the same thing. Stars are so close to each other that even if a planet is formed, the amount of time that it will survive is tremendously less. Like a few million years. So that's what I was trying to tell you by this point. Next please. Uh, yeah, now we'll move on to the significance part. So all the older clusters that we have, even in like open and globular clusters, they were all born at the same time, simultaneously. So there is a way we can find the age of the, all the stars uh, present in those particular clusters. <coughs> so basically, uh, whatever our understanding is about stellar evolution, or evolution of a star, rely on globular and open clusters itself. We study these clusters, we study these systems, and then we try to come up to a conclusion about or we try to theorize about how a star evolves in its life. Yes, and also, more the clusters, more they tell about the galaxy they are residing. So, as I said, uh, in a spiral galaxy, you'll have a lot of open clusters. So, if you see it uh, in, in a lot of tremendous amount of open clusters, you just tell that it should be a spiral galaxy. Even by looking at that galaxy, you should come to know that it's a spiral. It's very easy to get this expanded. And uh, irregular, uh, sorry, elliptical generally don't have any uh, open clusters. They might have some closed clusters, but not open because no star formation is happening. So the clusters that are close to us, close to our solar system or our sun, we can measure the distance by using parallax. I hope everyone knows what, uh, what is parallax, 11th or 12th grade, I guess. And finally, um, whenever, especially in an open cluster, uh, the stars and the planets, if there is a planet around it, these are all affected by the interactions uh, due to the or uh, interactions with the other star present in the same system. So whatever things that happen in a solar system might be because of another star in the same system as you. So this is what. Next, yes, my references is Wikipedia, uh, European Space Agency, NASA. Uh, Astrophoton, I've taken in those images by Astrophoton. You can just also visit, please visit LKD's website, uh, LKD Astrophotography website. He has, he has clicked really good photos if you want to see them. Then, Australia Telescope National Facility, Simbar, very good tool to use, especially those who want to do a career in. Astronomy and astrophysics, it's important to learn these things. Uh, there is a book, if you want to learn about embedded star clusters, a lot. There's a book, book called Birth of Star Clusters by Steven Stahler. It's a really good book. You can find it on Z Library, though I shouldn't say this, but you can find it over there. You can download it, you can read it. It's a good book. And finally, the Center for Astrophysics Harvard. Okay, yes. So I hope everyone. I hope all of you guys like my talk, it was not over your head or I don't know everything but I try to mention what I know a lot. I like means your suggestions, obviously, so that we can improve our talks, we can uh, introduce some new stuff and all. So I just it's a kind request and please scan this QR now and giving your suggestions uh, in the Google form.